happen when there's modifications? Now, let's just quickly discuss different examples of modifications. A modification can be when there is an increase in the fair value or equity instruments or when there is an increase in the number of equity instruments, when there is a reduced vesting period, when there is a reduced fair value, when there is any additional performance conditions added or when the number of equity instruments are reduced. Now, first you will have to identify if this modification is beneficial to the employees or not beneficial to the employees. Modifications will be tested on an awareness level. Now, when they indicate to you that this is beneficial to the employees, you need to determine what is the fair value of the modified instrument and if this exceeds the fair value of the original instrument at modification date you will have to recognize an incremental amount and this should be recognized over the remaining vesting period if it is not beneficial to the employees recognize as a minimum grant date fair value therefore you will ignore modification and you do not do anything Let's discuss a very basic example on a modification. In this example, we have equity settled share-based payments. Therefore, remember, if equity settled, we need to measure our share-based payment reserve at fair value on grant date. Now, the fair value on grant date is 10 Rand and our vesting period is three years. At the end of year one, we need to recognize for our one employee times 10 options times 10 rand times 1 over 3 and this will be 33.33 rand. At the end of year 2, remember, times 2 over 3 and this will be rounded up to 6, 7 and at the end of year 3 times 3 over 3 and this will be 100. Now let's just quickly stop guys. If there's no vesting period, you need to remember at the end of year one, you will have to recognize the total 100 rand. Now let's get back to this basic example. At the end of year one, this is at the end of year one, they've indicated that our employee will now be able to receive an additional five options and the fair value still remains 10 rand at that date remember guys this will now be a new grant date modification grant date therefore at the end of year one beginning of year two if we now need to recognize the share based payment reserve at the end of year two how do we calculate this Remember, our period will now be one, two years for the modification section only. Therefore, if we now need to calculate this, we will use our one employee times the additional five times 10 times one over two. And this will be 25. And at the end of year three, an additional 50. Guys, you see, when there's a modification, you will only look at the remaining period. In our example, we will look at the calculation of our incremental amount. How will we treat a cancellation? Before we look at this, we first need to ensure that we understand what is a cancellation in terms of RFRS2. This will be the failure to meet a condition other than a vesting condition, including settling shares or options during vesting period. Including, if they settle shares or options during the vesting period, in terms of RFRS2, we will identify this within the accounting treatment of cancellations. Let's have a look at the different accounting treatments. The first one, how do we account for a normal cancellation as for an accelerated vesting? 
you need to recognize the unrecognized amounts. I'm going to explain this by means of a very basic example that I've included. Guys, please do not write this out. You do have sufficient examples. I just want to explain to you the principle of what is an accelerated vesting. Now, in our example, we have equity settled share based payment transaction. Therefore, you need to know that we will measure this at fair value at grant date. If this would have been cash settled, you need to remember that you will have to remeasure the fair value at the end of each reporting period. We have a vesting period of three years originally. We have 10 employees, 10 options, and vesting period three years. Now, at the end of year one, they decide to cancel this agreement. Now, at the end of year one, if they cancel the agreement, how do we account for this? As for an accelerated vesting, Therefore, at the end of year one, we still had to recognize a total share-based payment reserve of triple three, 333. Therefore, our journal entry for year one will be your normal debit, your employee expense credit, share-based payment reserve, 167, 167. Now, at the end of year one, they cancel this. Therefore, we will have to debit employee expenses, credit, share-based payment reserve with the remaining amount, the triple three. This is our accelerated vesting, recognized, unrecognized amounts. Then number two, how do we account for settlement? Now, you will remember when we look at our basic example in terms of our equity settled share based parent reserve, I've indicated to you that we will look at this in detail within our lecture examples. Now, let's just quickly cover the theory principle. The indicator as settlement up to fair value will be treated as a repurchase of equity. And then the payment in excess of the fair value shall be an expense. Then what is the accounting treatment when we issue new instruments? You need to identify that this can either be one replacement, then you need to identify that you need to treat this as a modification that we have discussed just now. Or if this is not a replacement, you need to treat this as a cancellation. And you need to refer back to our number one. You need to recognize for the unrecognized amounts and the accelerated vesting. How do we deal with share-based payments within a group structure? Now, before we look at the principles, let's just quickly get back to basics. What is a share-based payment transaction? This is an agreement between an entity and another party with this other party can be employees the agreement is that the entity will receive goods or services services can be in the form of work provided by the employees and in return will provide the other party with either cash or equity instruments let's look at the principles our entity can be the one receiving the goods or services. Therefore, when you look at our basic example on your right hand side, remember the entity will receive goods or services. Then when the equity settled in own instruments or when the entity has no obligation to settle in share based payments with the counterparty. Remember now, if it's in its own equity instruments or there's no obligation we will recognize this as equity settled very similar to our normal rules otherwise cash settled if the entity is the settling party therefore guys entity settling share based payment transaction again now let's just quickly think about this one in a group remember we have a parent and subsidiary and it can be that the parent has an agreement with the 
employees of the subsidiary. Remember, the employees will then provide the goods or services to the subsidiary, but they will be able to receive shares in the parent. You with me on this one? We need to be able to identify who has the obligation. Is the obligation to pay for these shares in our parents' records or in our subsidiaries' records? FRST does not deal with intercompany repayments. Now, what does this mean? If, for example, our parent had to recognize a liability, FRS2 will not deal with the fact that the subsidiary might have to repay them for this liability. And we will work through examples on this. The accounting treatment of a BE transaction. If you look at this, the main thing that you need to ensure that you understand here is that one, we have an agreement between an entity and another party, which in this example will be our BE partner. In return for this employee to remain a BE partner in an entity, the entity will provide equity instruments shares. And what will the entity receive? They will be able to obtain points within their BE audit, most probably for ownership. Okay? Employment equity, no. Skills, no. Procurement, no. SED, no. Yes, additional for skills if you think about this training and so forth. Now the problem, guys. How do you quantify the value that the entity receives? based on the fact that they will obtain an extremely good BE level. How do you quantify? Therefore, how do you calculate this? If you think, for example, if our entity is, let's say, 51% black owned and they have a level one, if they are a generic entity, which is very difficult to obtain, our entity will receive large amounts of contracts in South Africa. But how are we going to quantify this additional value of this service or the fact that they obtain a very good BE level due to the fact that they've got a BE partner? FRG2 indicates to us the difference between the fair value of equity instruments granted now, this will be, remember, fair value equity instruments granted and fair value of the cash and other assets received. And they make reference to BE credentials. Now, guys, I don't know how you're going to quantify this, though, hey? Will represent an intangible asset that does not meet the definition of an intangible asset in terms of IS38. It is an intangible asset, yes, but it will not meet our de definition. Why not? Remember, the definition indicates to us that we will have to meet the recognition criteria. It has to be probable and reliably measured and therefore does not qualify for recognition as an intangible asset and we will have to expense this difference. Therefore, guys, let's recap. The difference between the fair value of our equity instruments and the fair value of the goods, services received, we need to expense. Then they indicate to us, if the BE equity credentials are attributable to another intangible asset, it should be capitalized to the fair value of that intangible asset and any additional BE equity credential costs should be expensed. Okay guys, so this is where it's actually very important that you need to know your intangible asset definition in terms of IS38. Now, a few problems. If it's equity settled, how are we going to measure this? How are we going to recognize equity versus expense? You know that. You will have to debit the expense or asset and credit share-based payment reserve. 
measurement indirectly by reference to the fair value of our equity. If there's any vesting conditions, you will do this very similar to your rules of RFRS2. And therefore, guys, extremely important, you will have to read the given information to be able to distinguish if this is an intangible asset that cannot be recognized, then you need to know you have to expense this or if this is an intangible asset that can be recognized. To explain the principles on taxation and disclosure, I will work through example 10 and 11 with you.